Welcome to Keep What You Earn, your judgment and jargon-free zone for entrepreneurs of all levels. Get ready to learn how to scale your business, save money in taxes, and create a business that grows your wealth. If it feels like the financial side of business is like eating your vegetables, well then think of this podcast as the ranch dressing to make the process a little more enjoyable. My name is Shannon Weinstein. I'm a CPA and business owner on a mission to simplify money and empower others through knowledge. I hope this episode inspires you to take action, but remember that the information we share is for educational purposes only and is not individual tax advice. Now that we got that out of the way, let's start the show. So I've got an honest question for you. Are you living a life free of regret? Are you living a life that feels peaceful and aligned with what your passions, your vision, your purpose are? And if you don't, that's okay. But what I want to talk about today with you are the lessons that you can learn from those who are actually facing their own mortality. Because unfortunately, we are all human. We are all mortal beings. And we don't like to face our own mortality. But one of the things you can do by embracing this is to reflect and to absorb some wisdom from those who are faced with their mortality and actually implement ways to reduce regret in your life. And I'm so excited to welcome onto the show today my guest, Jordan Grummet. Now, Jordan is the host of the Earn and Invest podcast. He's actually a physician turned hospice care doctor turned personal finance expert. And I'm really excited to talk to him because he has developed a passion, and I love his story, a passion for assisting with hospice care after being burnt out as a physician for so many years, a lot of lessons he learned about his own life and burnout, a lot of lessons that he learned from the dying and their families, and a lot that he took away that he's able to then channel into his work and his content surrounding personal finance and wealth building for those who are around today. And I'm really excited to welcome him onto the show, hear more of his story. And so after years of blogging about financial independence and wellness, he is the host of the Earn and Invest podcast. Take a listen to that. And he also received the Plutus Award for the Best New Personal Finance Podcast and was nominated for the Best Personal Finance Podcast of the Year in 2020. So this guy knows, knows what he's talking about. There's a ton that you can glean from this conversation. And make sure you check out his book, Taking Stock, available where all books are sold. Definitely check it out. And let's hear from Jordan. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for the conversation. Me too. So could you just introduce yourself briefly to everyone listening? Sure. My name is Jordan Grummet. I also go by Doc G. I pretty much became a doctor after years when my father died when I was seven years old, and I decided I wanted to be just like him. So I studied really, really hard, became a doctor, burned out, and in the process of burning out and trying to figure out how I wanted to live my life, discovered the financial independence movement and realized that I could quit my job right away, that I never had to be a doctor again. I could escape all that burnout, but instead of being excited, that made me a little bit anxious because I had no idea what I was running to, who I wanted to be. I had spent so much time building an identity and even purpose based on being a physician that I had to explore who I was and what I wanted to do. That led to writing a financial blog and eventually a podcast called Earn and Invest. And I had an epiphany one day that my dying patients that I was taking care of as a hospice doctor actually had a lot to say about how we should live life and even how we should spend our money. And that led to a book called Taking Stock. Wow. And I can relate to that so much, even though I wasn't as young. I lost my dad when I was about 25, 26. And same thing. It was this, I was an accountant because he was an accountant and he was my kind of guiding light the whole way. And then I hit this crossroads of what am I going to do next? And what am I doing this for? And what is my bigger purpose? So I can completely relate to that. And just a little bit more about your, your journey as a physician, you know, did you enjoy it? What was your, what was driving you toward that career? And did anything shift along the way where you realized that that wasn't the career that you wanted to pursue anymore? What led to that? So I was excited and very passionate about becoming a doctor. As I said, my dad had done it. He was very well known. He was a cancer doctor and oncologist. And when he died, I was seven and I really idolized him. So I never really thought of doing anything other than this. I mean, I had a learning disability. There was a good possibility that I wasn't even going to be able to read where my peers were, but that never really got in the way of this idea that 
I was going to become a doctor. And that really filled me up in a lot of ways. It gave me purpose throughout high school and college. I loved the practice of medicine. It just turned out to be more stressful and more anxiety producing. And at some point, not exactly how I thought I would be spending my time. So there are many times when burnout really started to affect me. One of the major ones was when I was in residency and I had this horrible episode when I was the only doctor in the ICU. I was a second year resident and I had a patient die of respiratory distress late at night and his family came in and I alone at one in the morning had to sit and tell his family about him dying. And the next morning I was exhausted. I hadn't slept for more than 24 hours. I was still working and a bunch of calls came in and it turned out that the guy's family that came the night before was his new family, but he had three daughters from pre-existing marriage and they were all out of town. None of them talked to each other and none of them had any idea what had happened. And I had to tell them all over the phone that their loved one had died. And it was just such a horrendous experience that it started me building up these walls to protect myself so that I could make these difficult, important decisions and not worry about them and not take it personally. But in the process of building up all these walls, I became a very cold person. And it was the beginning of my burnout. As I went and eventually practiced, I found that I was spending more time on computers and doing electronic medical records and doing compliance and filling out forms and less and less time helping people. I can't say that I didn't like being a physician. It was something I was actually very good at and it was very fulfilling in some ways. And people opened up their lives and their stories to me. And that was very precious. But what I realized as I got older is it just didn't feel like it was the thing I should be doing. I always tell people, you know, I didn't make a lot of friends during medical school. And as a doctor, I never wanted to go hang out at the doctor's lounge. In fact, I found myself at parties with my wife and we'd be meeting new people and I would try not to tell them what I do for a living because it didn't sit comfortably with me. So I started to realize that although this was, there were very many good things to being a doctor. I mean, I made lots of money. I changed people's lives. I got to do something really important. It didn't really fit my personality and probably never did. But it took many, many years to realize that. So it was a slow process. And even when I finally did realize, A, I had enough money that I didn't have to be a doctor anymore, and B, that being a doctor wasn't fulfilling me, I didn't get rid of everything. As I started whittling those things out of medicine I didn't like, I realized that the hospice work still connected with me. In fact, I often tell people it's the work I would do even if I wasn't being paid for it. So I knew even though I was walking away from this physician identity that there were parts of it that still really fit and that I wanted to hold on to. And I thank you for sharing that because I know there are so many listening who are going through a similar struggle and realizing like, I have a great impact. I have a great income. Why am I still unfulfilled or why am I still somehow uncomfortable with my profession or my career? That, is, that hits home <laughs> for sure. I felt that as an accountant as well going like, but I'm checking all the boxes. Why am I still unhappy? You know, everything that where you're told that you should pursue. So I thank you for sharing that. Let's lead into, so did you then move into hospice care and that's when you started serving patients in a different way? Or are you referring to your time in hospice that was, that was really a struggle? So I started doing hospice work when I was a medical student. My first mm. week of medical school, I volunteered in the inpatient hospice and actually found it to be a very deep, meaningful experience. I look back now and realize if I was more in touch with my true sense of purpose and identity, I might have gone into hospice full time at that point and maybe would have never burned out. But I didn't realize it at that time. And so I pursued general internal medicine, which probably didn't fit me as well. But we kind of do the things we're good at and that speak to us. So even when I did general internal medicine, I ended up taking care of a lot of elderly. And because I took care of a lot of elderly, I ended up helping a lot of my patients at the end of life anyway. And so I would consult hospice. And so I was doing this for years. And eventually a hospice nurse came to see a patient who I consulted them to come see my patient who was dying. And she looked at everything I did. And she's like, you just did everything we would do anyway. Why don't you come work for us? And so I didn't work for them full time, but I started what I would call a medical side hustle. I started doing extra work as a hospice medical director on the side. And so that was about 10 years into my career. And I did it very, very part time until I got to the point where I realized, A, I had enough money that I didn't need to be doing these things I didn't want to do anymore. And B, I got so burned out with general medicine uh, that I started getting rid of everything else and increasing my hospice time. And so I did that for quite a while. And eventually I said, well, I love hospice work, but I truly don't need to be working this many hours. And there are other things that speak to me in life, other purposes that I haven't pursued. And so that I eventually even whittled down my hospice time to 10 or 15 hours a week, 
no nights, no weekends, no being on call. I kind of get rid of everything I didn't like about it and just kept the things I liked. I love that. And, and the awareness to be able to do that too. So going into that, I know that a lot stemmed from your work in hospice, a lot of these other missions, right? Like educating people, the book, taking stock. Talk to me a bit about the lessons learned in hospice and when that kind of shifted for you, where you realized how many lessons there were to learn from the folks who were in that position. So you have to realize as I got to this point where I learned about financial independence and I knew that I had enough money and I could step away from medicine, I started giving myself permission to look at other things I was interested in. I had always been a communicator. I loved public speaking. I had been blogging about medicine for years, but always had been fitting it into the wee hours of the night or lunch breaks or whatever I could do because I convinced myself that it was more of a hobby. But those were the kind of things that really spoke to me. So when I discovered financial independence, I did a deep dive into that and started writing a blog about personal finance and financial independence. That led to a podcast. And when I was doing the podcast, I wanted to have those next level conversations, not how do we build wealth per se, but what that means and what we do with it after. And I was struggling with all these kind of big questions like, what does purpose look like in our lives? What does enough money look like? What do we do once we are financially successful? And I'd have all these experts on my show, these people who had done all these things, written books, built courses, and they would struggle with these same things. And I had an aha moment where one day I realized all of these questions were things I was also dealing with with my hospice patients. But my hospice patients were looking at it at a very different, through a very different lens because they were being told they had six months or less to live. And that was a great clarifier for them. All of a sudden, they had to be very clear about what was important, what wasn't important. And if they wanted to achieve anything in the next few months, what was it and how they were going to do that? And so the dying gave me all this insight into regrets that they had because all of a sudden they found that life was limited and it made them go back, look at their life and really question what they had done and not done. And so for me, the big epiphany is, why are we waiting until people are given these terminal diagnoses to do what we call a life review, to really look at our lives, think about what's important, what's purposeful, who are the important people, what were the important moments and decisions, and how can we then build that into our lives much, much earlier? Certainly, we can do that when we're financially independent because we have all sorts of time, but how do we actually build that into our lives when we're not? And then build a financial framework around it so that we can start doing those things we really want to do today so we don't end up having regrets when we're on our dying bed. And I just felt that these messages, the clarity I was getting from my dying patients would just be so helpful in these money discussions, these discussions about how we build wealth and what we do with it. And that's how those, both of those worlds collided. I think you're spot on with that, that a lot of people are chasing wealth with no real destination. Or they're chasing wealth for the sake of the, the wealth we experience in whatever we would call it, the material realm that we're in right now, right? And we're accumulating wealth, but for what purpose, for what end, for what mission? And, you know, it, it, it's terrible to, to think about, but we always say, like, we can die anytime, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're mortal beings. And what will happen? What will happen to your wealth? What does that actually mean in terms of, how you spent your, your life, not just your money. And I think that's, that's huge. Do you have any examples from your patients? Obviously, we're not going to name anyone, but any examples from patients and stories that, that you can share that were particularly impactful for you? So a, a story that I really like to talk about, and I changed everyone's names and changed their yes, stories. So they're, the themes and the theories are the same, but the specifics are different. But what I often talk about is a patient I took care of named Ernesto. And this really gets to this idea of living the life we want to live today instead of waiting till sometime tomorrow. Ernesto was in his 20s. He was climbing up the corporate ladder. He was making lots of money. And he did something that no one could quite understand. He took a year sabbatical from work, trained, and went to go climb Mount Everest. And people looked at him and said, you're crazy. You can do that later. You are building your career now. These are really important years. You're going to disappear for a year. You're going to come back and you're going to be behind. Everyone's going to have passed you up. But he didn't listen to them. 
I met Ernesto in his 40s when he was dying of leukemia, and the only thing he ever wanted to talk to any of us about were those days on the mountain. He actually didn't make it. They went about halfway up. The weather changed. It became too dangerous. He had to come back down, and by then he was out of time and had to come back. But on his dying bed, what he thought about most was this trip to Everest. And let's think about what if he had listened to everyone? What if he had decided, I can put that off, my career is too important, I need to make more money, it'll be financially easier, I'll have more time. And what if he had never got to that? What kind of regrets would he have? And I think another important lesson from this is it's not whether we succeed or fail. What we really regret is that we never had the courage to try. So Ernesto never really made it up to that mountain, to the top of the mountain. But he didn't regret that. I think he would have really regretted it if he didn't try. And so what I try to do is I try to reframe things and use some of the words we use investing, right? We're always talking about things like compounding and dividends. And so what I like to suggest is for Ernesto, the memories that he built doing this divinely purposeful thing for him compounded over the years. And became exceedingly meaningful. And even on his dying bed, they were still paying dividends. He was still rejoicing in those memories of something that was important to him. And so this is what I'm trying to get back to and remind people that, as you were saying before, when we look at money as a goal, it pretty much causes all sorts of problems. And what we should do is look at it as a tool to do these purposeful things, not just someday in the future, but also today. The problem is when you look at money as a goal, if you're lucky enough to reach that goal, you kind of find yourself lost because now you've hit the goal. You don't know what to do. A lot of people double down and then just double the money goal. But ultimately, they're on a treadmill and they're not getting anywhere real fast. Or the other thing that happens often is when they hit that money goal, they become petrified they're going to lose it. So it's something called loss aversion. We're doubly scared of losing what we've gained versus not getting there in the first place. So having money as a goal really generally leads to unhappiness. We have to start looking at it as a tool for a few reasons. One is that we can start using that money to climb the Mount Everest of the world. But the other thing we have to realize is it's just one of many goals. So just because you don't have money doesn't mean you can't live a purposeful life. It's just, for instance, earlier on in your life when you don't have as much money, we have to start using some of the other tools we have to build that purposeful life. Maybe it's your energy. Maybe it's your community. Maybe it's your passion. Whatever those things are besides money, we can use those when we don't have money. And hopefully, in the process of doing this, we eventually create some wealth that we can then also use as a tool. Right. And this is something I always say to my CFO clients is, I say, what's your goal? And they'll say something like $5 million in revenue. And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't convert it to dollars yet. I say, what's your goal? What are you going to do with the 5 million? What does that mean to you? What does that afford you? And then they'll say something like, well, I just, I want to keep growing. And I'm, why? And there's a whole lot of unpacking the why. And I, I went through this with a client actually, where we said, what is your goal? And she said, to put my daughter through private school. Okay, we can quantify that. So we converted that into a goal financially, but then we also converted that into micro goals of actions. Like what will it take to unlock that revenue, to enable you to do this? And how can we connect all those things together so that there's a common thread of that motivation towards that one mission? And it could be anything in life, but we always say it takes goals, turn into dollars, then turn that into actions. And that will get you the goal a lot faster. And it will be more fulfilling because you'll be able to say, I know exactly what I'm moving towards with this money, not just this constantly moving goalpost, because with money, And with business, a lot of the times, people listening to the show we've talked about a lot is my goal is 1 million in revenue. And then you hit that. And then your goal is two. And then your goal is five. The the goal is always in pencil because it's constantly moving and fluctuating because it's not anchored down to an actual tangible thing. And what I really love about that conversation, too, specifically like about the private school is when you keep on going down the whys, you get to much deeper things. Well, exactly. why do you want your kid to go to private school? Because I want them to get the best education. Why do you want them to get the best education? Because this is my legacy. I love them, whatever it is. And when you start getting past those whys, you actually get to action steps that don't necessarily need money too. 
right? So exactly. you want your daughter to get a good education. Well, private school is one way, but you're also 30 years old. You've got tons of energy. Your business keeps you busy to seven at night, but maybe from nine to 10, you can tutor her extra, or maybe, you know, there's a scholarship or maybe there are other ways around it. And that doesn't mean that money goals aren't good. It just means that sometimes when we walk back the whys, we start finding out what's purposeful to us. And we can start working on that purpose today and then let the money augment it. But it doesn't have to be the do or die. And and that's why I think kind of walking back those whys, asking those repetitive questions, getting past that mirage of money is so important so that we can really dig deep. And, and the money, again, money is a great thing and it is a powerful tool. I just want people to realize that it's one of many tools and we don't want that to make us push off our goals forever because time is limited. Yeah, it's just one of the levers to pull to help you accomplish that goal in the time period that you want to. That's really exactly. that's really all it is. And and that's so important to understand when people are chasing money, like your goals are not always in dollars and cents. Yeah. And I know that you you mentioned different archetypes for building wealth. So I want to dig into that a bit. You know, what are the different archetypes that you see for building wealth? Can you just kind of like provide us a structure or framework that you use for that? So I definitely can. And I often say, let's put purpose and identity into perspective first. And then once we have some idea of that, well, then how are we going to accumulate the wealth? And I do so in the book with something called the parable of the three brothers. And it's just a story about three brothers who are very different and who walk their path of life in a slightly different way. The first brother rushes through and wants to get to the end of the path as quick as possible so that they can do whatever they want with their lives. The second brother doesn't love the path nearly pretty much like the first brother, but doesn't have the stamina to just rush through the whole way. So the second brother stops and takes lots of breaks and then rushes forward a little bit and then takes more breaks and then rushes forward a little bit. And finally, the last brother actually loves the path, completely takes their time, does whatever they want to do, enjoys the scenery. And when the last brother gets to the end of the path, they do something that neither of the other brothers can quite understand. That last brother turns around and walks back the way they came. So the big question when we're talking about our finances is which brother do you relate with? And if you can think about that as a parable, we can start looking at how we build the financial framework around our lives. So that first brother who I call the eldest brother, that's someone who kind of was like me. They found that they didn't love their job, but they made a lot of money doing it. So they grinded it out, made a lot of money invested it, and then maybe at a very young age could walk away from work the way I did and live the life they wanted to do. This is very much deferred gratification. It's saying, I'm aware that I have a sense of purpose and identity. If I work really hard and put that off for a while, I can eventually fully pursue that in the future. And that's one way of doing things, especially if you are not worried about dying young, right? So if you're like, I'm going to live to a way old age, I've got plenty of time, that's a great path to take, and it allows you to accumulate a lot of wealth and live off that wealth and then really spend maybe the second half of your life doing exactly what you want to do. That's the eldest brother of the first brother. The middle brother, very much like the eldest, doesn't love work, wants to pursue a sense of purpose and identity, but doesn't have the stamina to just grind it out. These are the people who I really think should go after something like passive income or side hustles. The idea is instead of accumulating this big net worth that then supports you, they actually try to create monthly revenue doing something that's reasonable for them that can then support their monthly needs. So for them, that might be real estate and being a landlord, or it might be an online business, or there are many ways of building revenue streams. We call it passive, and it's not really passive because often you have to do a lot of work in the beginning, but you build up these revenue streams then need a little bit less maintenance and then live off of those. This can be a great way to start living the life you want to live earlier, right? You don't have to grind it out for 10 or 15 years. Maybe after two or three years, you can get these passive revenue streams going and you can live the life you want to live. But you might have to maintain these revenue streams for a lot longer because you don't have as much savings, right? So retirement, in a sense, quote unquote, retirement is much farther off. And then the last path, what I call the path of the youngest brother is, you know, if you are totally passionate on an idea and you build that into a career and love that career, in a sense, you have enough money the minute you find that job that pays your monthly needs. So it might be the fastest way to financial independence. It's called the passion play. If you end up being an architect or an artist and you love doing that and you can create enough doing that, enough wealth doing that to pay your monthly needs, 
you're pretty much there right away. And those are just three paths. There are probably many other paths or they're hybrids. There's lots of different ways to do this. The point is once you figure out what's important to you, then you can start using some of these different roads, these different paths to try to build wealth in your life and start hopefully living the life you want to sooner or even now as opposed to putting it off forever. And what does what does the metaphor mean when he walks back? Well, the youngest brother, because he loves what he's doing, he doesn't want to stop. So even when he gets to the point where he has enough money and things are great and maybe he never has to work again, he turns around and walks back the way he came because he wants to keep doing what he's doing. And yeah. that's why the it's called the passion player, the youngest brother. That's why it's so powerful, because pretty much you start financially independent the minute you can get that job that pays you enough and you stay that way the rest of your life. And so if the goal, in my opinion, the goal of all this is to live a life of purpose, identity, and connections, the oldest and the middle brothers have to do a lot of work to get there. But the youngest brother is kind of magical because they start living a life of purpose, identity, and connections from day one. So they've kind of won the game. So as long as they keep doing what they're doing, regardless of where their finances are at, they're going to be pretty happy in life. Yeah. And there's one thing that I was, I assumed you were going to say that you didn't. And I thought it, I thought the end of the story was he goes back and brings someone else too. <laughs> and I was like, Ooh, <laughs> because that's also, then it's also go back and tell people that there's a better way because I feel like a lot of people are taught to be the oldest and they're conditioned I, into that mindset of if you work really hard, if you work really, it's the same person who's told him not to climb Everest. You can wait till the second half of the path. Right now, you got to hustle. And I think that's completely shifting right now. I think it is, but I don't want to be Pollyanna about it. And I don't mm -hmm. even want to give value judgments to any of the roads because I think all of the roads are reasonable and fulfill people at different parts of their lives. True. Listen, the passion play is exciting, right? This idea that I can do a job I love and you never have to work again. But let's be honest. That's not how life is. Even if you love your job, eventually you might work for someone you don't love. Eventually the stresses of that job might get to you. Sometimes we have something we love, like I want to be a painter and I love painting and I paint 100 paintings a year. But guess what? If I can only sell one, that might not sustain me. So no matter how passionate I am about that, not everyone can actually make money doing the thing they're passionate about. I'm super passionate about podcasting and writing and being an author and doing those things. I don't know if I could have truly supported my lifestyle doing those things. Instead, Absolutely. I was the eldest brother. I made a lot of money being a doctor. I vested it wisely. And now I can go do the things I want to do. I don't know if I would have succeeded. And I guess one other story that, that relates to this is when I was young, I used to love artwork. Same. I was... I was furnishing my house. I was a resident. I was living in St. Louis and I would go to the mall down the street and they had a gallery there and they had all this wonderful artwork and it cost like two or $3,000 a painting and I didn't want to spend that much. So what I did is at the time, it was early 2000s, eBay was just becoming a thing. And I found a bunch of people on eBay who were selling the same artists for a lot less. And I got on the phone and started calling these people selling this artwork for a lot less and eventually learned some of their secrets. And I started a business selling artwork. And I would buy all these paintings and then I'd sell them either on eBay or online. The reason why I bring up this story is I loved artwork when I started the process, but after handling hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of this artwork, it became just paper to me. I would get another beautiful painting in, not think twice about it, wrap it up and send it to someone else. And so I guess the point is sometimes when we take something we're truly motivated and passionate about to do and it becomes our job we lose the motivation and joy in it. And so Agreed. again, I don't want to be Pollyanna about the path of the youngest brother. I think if you happen to be lucky enough that that works for you, you're a violinist and you can make a living at it and you love doing it. Who knows? There's some people like that, but it's not for everyone. And there are a lot of happy people who are eldest and middle brothers too. And so yeah. I'm kind of in between on that. I love this idea. And certainly I agree with you. The world is changing such that we're starting to look at lifestyle design and starting to look at how can we use for instance, the power of being online and the virtual workplace to start doing things today that we want to do as opposed to putting them off and working in such a way that's fulfilling to us. But that's still hard. Some people get very lucky and find that, but not everyone does. And I don't want that to be a hurdle that stops people from living the lives they want to live. 
Yeah. I also think that never in our history have we been more equipped to make some of those choices if we needed to. Because I know, like, at least my parents' generation, they didn't have, you know, side hustles. They didn't have Uber. They didn't have online. They didn't have any of that. And it was, you know, work for the same company for 30 years was what was expected. I just think there's a lot of, like, paradigm shifts happening that are opening up these different paths for people in a, in a way that they've never been open before. And, uh, and I know we haven't discussed this before the show, but, and, and some of the listeners have heard it, but a bit of our story, me and my husband, both of our dads passed away from cancer and my dad was 56. His dad was, I believe, 62. And they were answering work emails until the day before they died. Yeah. yeah. And at the promise of this, this promised land at 65, right? Neither one of them made it to 65. And we looked at ourselves and we were like, what the hell are we waiting for? We had this complete moment of, oh my God, it's not promise. It's not guaranteed. Who, like the, the nerve of us to assume that if we bust our butts for 40 years, that we are somehow going to reach the end of this rainbow. Like the, in, in your parable of the three brothers, right? The road can end yep. at any point. So you're, you know, if you're the oldest brother, again, nothing wrong with that. Like you said, there is a risk because you're going to, you know, the road can just abruptly end. And, and that's what we don't take into account. We, we plan ahead in the assumption and it's a big assumption sometimes to assume that we're going to be living till we're 65 and beyond. And, and that was a huge epiphany for my husband and I. And that's why we ended up actually during COVID buying a house and moving to Costa Rica. Yeah. We were like, what are we waiting for? This is when we should be doing this. This is when it's just like the Everest story. It's like, are you guys crazy? You have careers, you have this, you have the business, what is going on? And we were like, when the hell else are we going to do this? When we're, when we're too old to enjoy it or when we're not around, like this is something we want to do. So I a hundred percent relate to that. Yeah. And what I really love, again, is this idea that, you know, we can toggle back and forth. There are different seasons in our lives. And I think if we are really thoughtful about what purpose looks like, like, then we can say, this is a season where I am going to work really hard for the next two or three years. And you can do that intentionally. And yes, you could choose wrongly. I mean, that's life, right? Yeah. But but I I think I don't think there's wrong choices. I think it's just going in the wrong direction to find out it's the wrong direction. Yeah. And I think when we start with purpose, those decisions then we make, make more sense for us. And we live a little bit more fulfilled lives today. And and, and that's the goal because different paths work for different people, but it always starts with thinking about what's important to you as a person, what has purpose and meaning, and then building from there. And I, and I also have to add in too, to add credibility to what you said that like, I'm an accountant. My husband was a business owner. Like, Oh, we busted our butts for 15 years of our career. Like, I don't I worked 55 to 80 hour weeks as an yeah. accountant. Wouldn't I would not trade a day I've done that for anything, but I would not go back. Right. <laughs> you know, I am very proud of the path I've walked so far, but that has opened up other paths. I think that in a sense you you basically no doubt, I think you need to develop work ethic and I need you need to invest the time and energy into what it is you want to do that's that's needed. You serve what is really needed of you. And then I feel like all these paths open up for you, just like you with your, your being a physician. And certain career choices open up the choices. My dad said the same thing. I actually loved to draw when I was a kid. And my dad said, be an accountant and you can, you can draw all you want. Hmm. If you become an artist, you're going to be, you're going to be, you're going to start hating drawing. Because once it pays the mortgage, it's not fun. It's something you have to do, even when you don't want to do it. And I, and that, he told me that when I was 16. And I was like, oh, yeah, that doesn't sound fun. He's like, imagine if like your hand's hurting and you don't want to draw it. Well, what, again, what the hell is hand drawn anymore? But <laughs> what, <laughs> I wanted to be a Disney animator so badly. And he was like, no. And, and, and most, of the, most people would say, oh my God, he crushed your dream. I'm like, no, that is exactly what I needed to hear. What and and yes, I can still sketch. I can still do all these things, but I can do it on my porch in Costa Rica, <laughs> and I can have fun doing it. Same thing. I used to teach fitness classes, right? And I and they were like, "Why wouldn't you do this full time? You're so good at it. You love it because it won't be fun if it pays the mortgage." And I know it. Yeah, the you know it's behavioral theory, and they they've studied mm-hmm. what intrinsically motivates us, 
And one of the quickest ways to kill internal motivation is to pay someone for it. <laughs> is to reward is to reward them monetarily for something it's they're a deeply a transaction. for something they're deeply internally motivated to do. Yeah. Exactly. When you create a transaction, it completely changes the uh, the approach to it. I would agree entirely. No, I love that. And it's it's something we've, you know, my husband and I have both tried to live and say, I love it too much to make it a career. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's such a foreign concept because we always say, follow your passion, but there's kind of the, all these little asterisks to that, right? Yeah. And, and again, I think we do have to follow our passions, but again, we, for some reason decided that that means we also have to make money or make a living doing that. And that's not necessarily the same thing. There's lots of different ways to follow our passions. And I think a really good way, especially for young people who don't have much money, is to work their nine to five, but then create a side hustle in which they follow their passion and see what happens. And it might just stay a passion and you might not make any money at it, but you might love doing it. And so that's a great use of your time. On the other hand, if it does produce a little revenue, maybe that means you work instead of nine to five, you work 10 to four, or maybe you work Monday through Thursday instead of Monday through Friday. And you can toggle and play with those, building a little passion, whether it makes money or not, but ultimately, our whole goal of all of this is to fill as much of our limited resource, which is time, with things that we intrinsically are motivated to do or things that feel purposeful for us. So you kind of win the game every time you replace time that you are doing something you didn't want to do or doing nothing and putting something in that time space that you want to do or that feels purposeful. And so, again, this idea of how do we start building that more purposeful activity into our life, that doesn't mean it has to be your nine to five, but how can we look at where we are today and change the allotment over time so more and more time is spent doing things that really feel meaningful to us? I completely agree. And when we talk about sort of maximizing our time, because we have the same 24 hours in a day and time is the most limited resource we all have, what, what is your advice to those listening on how to maximize your time and to maximize what you get out of every minute, hour, week, month, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I think we have to change the transactional nature that we talk about time with. Time is not a commodity. It can't be bought or sold. It can't be spent. It can't be wasted. Time just passes. And there is not a thing we can do about it. So ultimately, the only things we have real control over, and there are two of them, one is what activities we we fill in those time slots. And the other is the way we perceive time. I don't want to spend a lot of talk time about thinking about how we perceive time, but just rationalize this idea that when you are busy doing something you love, time tends to fly. And when you're doing something you hate, time tends to feel really slow. So if I say, sit and read your favorite book and do it for five minutes, that time will pass very quickly. On the other hand, if I say, get on the floor into the plank position and hold that for five minutes, that time is going to be the longest five minutes of your life, right? So we know that we can perceive time differently depending on what's going on in life. When we are young, time, teams, time seems to go slowly. If you remember when you were an elementary school kid, it seemed like the summer lasted forever. And yet as we get older, time seems to go much faster. The seasons pass faster. We seem to get old much faster. Just something to realize, right? So that's something to think about. But really, what I want to get people to do is start thinking about the time they have left. And we have no idea how much that is. Is it years? Is it decades? We don't know. But if you break that time we have left into time slots, whether you think about it as hours or days or minutes, whatever, we have a certain set amount of time slots, and that time passes no matter what we do. So the real question is, how are we going to take where we are today, where some of those time slots are filled with things we love to do? And then some of them are filled with things we loathe to do. How do we start building a life where we can minimize those time slots that are filled with things we loathe to do and start building in things we love to do? And so the idea behind this is there's a few different ways we could do this. And this, again, gets back to the three brothers. You can either build enough wealth so that you don't have to spend time doing anything but only things of your choosing. That's one way. Or you can start building a life today that not only allows you to do things you love to do to fill those time slots adequately, but also pays the bills. And so there are different ways to look at this, but until we start thinking of those time slots and start being really intentional about what activities we're pursuing during those time slots, 
but we're not going to really understand time that well. And so that's my goal, right? Figure out how you want to fill those time slots, build a financial framework that allows you to put as many things you love into those time slots and get rid of as many things that you loathe and repeat and repeat and repeat until most of those time slots are filled with things you like doing. I love it. Jordan, how can folks learn more about you, about your book, about everything that you have to share and that you've shared with us today? So the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can find links to pretty much A, the book, Taking Stock, and then B, to all the ways I create content. There are links to my medical blog, which I stopped in about 2018, but I did that for a good 10 years. Um, there are links to my financial blog called diversify.com. And last and not least, there are, there are links to what I do mostly today, which is the Earn and Invest podcast. Amazing. Go take a listen to Earn and Invest podcast and definitely check out the book. Jordan, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I can't believe how many episodes we've released of Keep What You Earn. There are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in tax savings contained in our episode library. And there are so many topics that we cover. To make it easier to find more of what you need right now, we actually created a custom curated playlist just for you. That's right, a playlist of value-packed episodes that you're looking for based on your goals right now in your business. Whether you're making your first sale, trying to strategize your taxes, or you're scaling your team, there is something here for everyone. Check out the podcast playlist generator now using the link in the show notes and explore your custom playlist. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform. This small action goes a long way for podcasters to get our message heard by more business owners just like you. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to information about our guests and ways to get in touch with me. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye.